Uh, evening, Rory. Yo. So, uh, I'm sure people realise at this stage, we stream Monday night and Wednesday night rugby at 5 o'clock on Facebook Live so that, frankly, people who are leaving the office can get their fix of rugby early doors and then play it out on the evening show. Uh, we did that earlier on at 5 o'clock. Yourself, myself and Matt Williams chatted through the weekend's rugby and we'll play that out very shortly. But at that stage, we were making the point that all we had to go on regarding the alleged incidents up in Belfast was uh, Simon Zebo's tweet, which... Uh, was to the effect, I hope my ears deceive me with some comments directed my way from the crowd. Hashtag not on, Django always wins. And there was, as you might expect, some speculation. He was talking about racist comments uh, when he used the word comments as well, as opposed to just the general booing which was going on in the back of the Michael Lowry incident, we presume, from the U Arena. So we literally walked out of our chat mm. and then we saw Racing 92 had released a statement which clarified matters. Racing 92 strongly condemns the racist insults that Simon Zebo was targeted with on Saturday during the European uh, Cup game between this club and Ulster Rugby at Kingspan Stadium in Belfast. Racism has no place in rugby in which the values of solidarity and togetherness are the exact opposite of any forms of discrimination. Uh, they went on to say Racing does not wish to stigmatise Ulster Rugby as a whole. The insults suffered by Zebo are the actions of only one or two individuals and have been condemned by many Ulster fans who have shown their support for Simon. End of statement. Uh, we offered Simon Zebo the opportunity to come on the show this evening. He, understandably, I think, wants to keep the head down and focus on a game on Saturday. But um, we can presume, Rory, that Rassi 92 wouldn't have released a statement without clarifying the situation with Zebo. so we can certainly take it that the uh, comments he heard directed his way, as he tweeted about, were uh, racist, um, which elevates this story uh, very quickly to an unbelievably serious matter. Absolutely, Joe. And like, I, I think it's better for everyone that there's clarity around it because Simon Zuber was obviously annoyed enough at what he was subjected to to put it out there. But until he, until we were clear about what, until I, everyone out there was clear about what he was alleging and what um, the, the, the nature of what was said, you know, we couldn't properly properly discuss it. And, and I'm back in my brain trying to think of a, a similar incident in the last number of years in Irish. Rugby, there's been incidents across other sports here and there, but it's not something that I, I, I can recall off the top of my head. Um, it's something that's hugely serious. It sounds like Ulster, certainly Dan McFarland was appealing for witnesses today. They're launching their own investigation. You know, they've had, they've had unbelievably negative publicity over the last 18 months. Mm. You know, they don't, you know, they did, the last thing they needed was to be, to be embroiled in in another bad news story, but they have to deal with this now, and it may have been only the actions of one or two people, but that's um, that is serious enough that it needs like it needs to be taken really, really seriously because there's absolutely no place in, in Irish sport and no place for an Irish rugby. So, um, yeah, EPCR are standing back and letting Ulster have a look into it themselves, um, but I'm sure that they are very conscious of the, the publicity that will generate and the seriousness of the issue because their players of all, regardless of all races, religions and all that sort of thing, are, you know, across the spectrum and, and they, they need to snap it out as well. Yeah, I'll be interested to see if the EPC or are obligated now to investigate it themselves, but it seems it's Ulster leading the investigation at the moment. Here's a very short clip, Dan McFarland speaking earlier on today before the Racing Statement. If there's anybody out there who knows what happened, um, and if something happened and can give information on that, look, we, we want to know. You know, we want, we want to know because um, nobody should have to put up with that. So there you are. I mean, there is a point here where, as Racine have pointed out, it was one or two, and there's just no legislating for idiots. Um, so, you know, it's, it's hard to draw broad conclusions about this, but it is shocking that an Irish international is abused racially playing up in Belfast. He's represented the country, scored tries for countries for the country. Uh, clearly, racism is abhor abhorrent regardless, so it's no worse or no better. But it was uh, that extra bit shocking, I must say. Yeah, look, we all knew he was going to go in, come in for a little bit of a torrid time because of his, his gesture at Michael Lowry in the last game, yeah. and, and he was booed roundly, and I think he would have expected that and probably got a bit of a kick out of it. Um, but yeah, look, the, the, these individuals have crossed cross the line um, you know and, and yeah it, it is the act of an individual but I think the message needs to be sent out that there's no place for it mm. that any idiots who, who go to a game should should know that there is no place for it and um, yeah that there is something yeah it's, it's all the more galling at the fact that it, you know Simon Zebo is a household name he's delivered from the national team on so many occasions you know he yeah he didn't like nobody deserves uh, the, 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 the well the alleged comments that, that he's that he's come across but 
you know, it just yeah, as I say, it's all the more galling that it's him that it's one of, one of our own essentially who's who's come home his first game in Ireland since he left, and um, he's subjected to that. So it looks, yeah. he, I think Dan McFarland's quote uh, comments there are exactly you know on the money. He's, he doesn't he seems to be fairly unequivocal about the fact that they want to get to the bottom of us. Um, he's condemning it, and um, you know Ulster would we'll, we'll do well to, to, to go after it, but at the same time, identifying the individuals in, in an 18,000 capacity yeah. crowd or, or whatever it was on Saturday is going to be a difficult thing to no, do. That's true, um, and, and I, I, know, cause like, I, I, I'm not sure, did, like, would Kingspan have the sophistication of CCTV that your standard Premier League ground has now? I'm not, I don't know. Well, I, I, I'm not aware. I, I know, that, like, as a recent refurbished ground, which hosted a World Rugby, um, you know, the World, World Rugby Women's World Cup, Two or three years ago, you know, they had the final, the semi-final. There, it will be up to fairly good spec. Yeah. Um, and I, I, there is kind of a substantial-looking kind of police facility there, but I don't know how close they can zoom in and all that sort of stuff, and you know whether they can go back through the tapes a couple of days uh, afterwards. I'm not sure, yeah. but um, it, it is. I'll probably uh, of, of the Irish Rugby Grounds is probably one of the better set up for this sort of thing because it is, um, you know, relatively recently done. Um, but yeah, like it, it, that 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 task now. I think they're probably relying on fellow supporters. Um, to come forward and, and see the wrong on this, and to to um, to give evidence, uh, you know, about what happened, and, and to kind of give them the idea or an idea of, of what happened, what was said, and who said it. Because really, you know, the, if if they can identify these people, you're looking at you know just lifetime bans and that sort of thing. Because that's the way it, it has to be handled. Because there's no place for it. Yeah. Okay. Well, that's the breaking news this evening. At this point, all we can do is let the investigation take its course. Rory, thanks very much for coming yeah, on sure. again this evening. Rory O'Connor of the Irish Independent. So, another European weekend gone, another one to come, and we had four Irish wins from four. All four can still make a knock the knockout stages in Europe, which would be a first, actually. So, on Friday night, well, it was the Joey Carberry show, amongst other things. 26 points, two tries, one assist, 80 metres with the ball in hand, all contributing to Munster's 41 points to 15 win at King's Home. On Saturday, then, Leinster's strength and depth underlined at the RDS, a bonus point win against a Toulouse side who had been unbeaten since September, 12 matches unbeaten. And then Ulster, against all odds, we laughed Stephen Ferris out the door on Wednesday when he predicted an Ulster win. Uh, they beat Racing in Belfast to give themselves a real chance of progression and a strange game for Connacht. They hung on after going 17-0 up against Sale. In the end, it was 20 points to 18 in the Challenge Cup. Matt Williams is with us, and Rory O'Connor of the Irish Independent is here in studio. Uh, Rory, these are good times for the Irish provinces in Europe, to say the least. Yeah, they are, and we're getting to the stage where, you know, it, it, there's a natural inclination to wonder about the opposition and all that sort of stuff, but... I did have that um, nagging thought in my head. How much do they care about this? Uh, but they do care. You know, Gloucester sold out on Friday night, and it was a really good atmosphere, and they uh, they were applauding the players off with 10 minutes to go when they were being taken off because they felt like they'd given everything and come up short against a, a really top quality team and I think there's a very good chance of an Irish team um, winning it this year, certainly a good chance of getting two back to the semi-finals again. You know, Connacht could go on a run in the, the Challenge Cup as well. You know, Ulster are overperforming I think to where we all expected them to be. Mm. And it all, although there's a couple of injuries starting to come in, crop up, it's all pointing towards a very positive 2019 on the, the overall scale as well with the, with the national team kind of cherry picking the best from all four. So it's just a great time to be involved in Irish rugby. It's a great time for the players to, you know, all these players are, are, are all going into these games believing that they're going to beat the best teams in Europe. And, and the best teams in Europe are almost afraid of them. You know, and that's, we're in a kind of new paradigm there. Yeah. Uh, Matt, I think you went from, what, 25, 30 degrees in Australia to the coldest touchline I've been on in some time on Saturday, and now here we are. Do you know where you are yet? Uh, I'm somewhere, Joe, I, I know I'm talking to you, and I'll settle with that. Yeah, mate, it was, it was, I left Sydney, and it was 37 degrees, and I think it was about, the wind chill there must have been <laughs> down to about two, so I'm, oh, we survived it, mate, that's the main thing. Yeah, we did. Well, come on to Leinster in a moment. Let's go chronologically as much as anything. So Gloucester 15 points to Munster's 41, and things are all shaping up very nicely for next Saturday. Exeter with a bonus point win over Castor means they are certainly within striking distance of Munster at the top of Pool 2. That's next uh, Saturday, half past five in Thomond Park. It goes on head-to-head, -head, so in short, to be, give the real short version, if Munster avoid defeat, then they'll certainly go through, and there are other ways as well, even if Exeter win, that Munster can go through if they uh, get a losing bonus point or if they get the four tries and Exeter don't. But in short, Munster will go out to win that game, and that will see them safely through. As for Kingsholm on Friday, uh, Joey Carberry 
I mentioned some of the um, stats there. His 26 points, his two tries. Uh, there were lots of favourite moments you could have at Carberry's uh, performance, Rory. I think for most people it's the several quick calculations and the left-footed kick through for Andrew Conway, which summed up a whole heap. It was a magic moment, wasn't it? It was a, one of those times where the, everything in the stadium, you know, the whole thing's going helter-skelter and he just slows time down. Mm. And um, just put your, like on his, what's you know, ostensibly his bad foot, is able to put that, put that beautiful chip through. And it just summed up how calm he looked on the night and how dominant Munster were as well, that they were able to give him the time and space where he could thrive and, and deliver a performance that really marks, you know, we, we all knew he was talented, we all knew he was going to do, I think we all were com fairly confident he was going to do well in Munster, but, you know, there was a bit of, uh, you know, he had a hiccup in cast, he... There, there was always going to be growing pains to a degree. You know, he hasn't had a huge amount of experience at 10, but he, that was the most comfortable he's looked in a big game since he's gone down to Munster. And, and you know, he almost almost announced himself as a, as a rival to Johnny Sexton. I don't know if we're quite there yet. but yeah, how, Johnny, much an, how much of an almost is that now? Because I saw those, those mumblings happening this weekend. Yeah, I think it was um, Austin Healy uh, mischief, mischievously threw it out there on BT on Friday night. And I think it was kind of half a joke, but by the end it was less of a joke, you know. And I think, look, Johnny's a world player of the year. He's brilliant and, and has, is, you know, at his best remains the best <laughs> that is out there. Yeah. And I think, but I think if this knee injury that you know that has kept him out for the last couple of weeks proves to be more serious because we never quite know with, with injuries in Irish rugby. I think there's less concern now that Joey, uh, Joey Carby starting with Ross Byrne on the bench, even yeah. against England, with Conor Murray alongside him and, and the, the players they can put around them. You know, World Cup final, you still want Johnny Sexton starting, but we saw maybe on Stephen, or on the 29th that Joey Carby's a little bit in Johnny Sexton's head, you know, when he threw him to the ground, stood over him, the yeah. way he did with Ron O'Gara all those years ago, that he's starting to consider him a rival. And that can only be a good thing, because if he can push Johnny Sexton to be better, mm. well, that is only going to be good. And if Johnny Sexton does start to decline, because he is well into his 30s now, it's great, or, or suffers another injury, or this injury yet turns out to be... It just means that there's depth, and there wasn't depth a year ago. So that's, that's a good thing as well. So this move, for all that Leinster fans don't want to hear it, has been really positive it's for the overall success. picture. Yeah, yeah. I would think David Nusifor is sitting in his office somewhere saying, I mean, I've been vindicated thoroughly. And do you know, the Carberry experiment, and that's the wrong word for it at this stage, but it has been such a success that I think it's almost forcibly educated the rugby public about the merits of this and why it can work so well and why it will happen again in the future and there'll be less hoo-ha I think the next time. Matt, since the hiccup, and it was a severe enough hiccup in Castro, you would have to say for a young number 10 trying to find his way, since that game in Carberry's last three games he's scored 56 points, he's scored three tries, he's had 17 out of 17 successful kicks and that is hugely impressive because I must say I did expect at some stage this season when Carberry had the hiccup like he did against Castro that there would be um, a consequence to that. There, there would be a couple of weeks that would feel a bit fragile and he would have to be nursed back to health. But it, it's been anything but. He has bounced right back. He's been absolutely sensational, Joe, hasn't he? He's uh, so happy for the kid and so happy for uh, what he's given to Munster Rugby because he's changing the way they play. And they're, they're changing around him. They're putting structures around him that suit his style of, of game. But uh, the, the, as I remember talking uh, here on a Wednesday night back in, in September with Keith Wood and yourself and just saying the same thing. The, when when this, you put any young guy in that position, especially a 10, a, the 10 and 9s are making this, you know, hundreds of decisions in a game. They're going to have a night where sometimes those decisions are bad. That's just what's going to happen to, to every player as they move through, but especially your 9s and 10s. And they've obviously got a good support structure around Joey. He didn't lose confidence, and he's bounced back. But there'll be another day where he'll he'll um, he won't be perfect because he's still learning his mm. trade. Mm. He's still developing and growing, which is you know if he can play so well as he did the other night, and we can still say that that this guy is, is still learning his trade and learning how he he goes about things. You know he's going to grow into a really really good rugby player. Yeah, I think the coverage as well has been quite fair of him. Like any time he's discussed, it's almost it's always in in the context of a player who's learning. Uh, Van Graan talked generally about the team, saying Rory they they have still have loads of areas for improvement uh, from the Gloucester game. And if you're talking about Carberry, for instance, the restart in the second half, which drops short, that gave Gloucester a reel into a game yeah. and against better sides. You know, potentially away in France in a in a semi final. Actually, you can't get the restart wrong, especially when things will be fi finally poised. 
Yeah, and I think that's the lesson all the teams will be looking at this week. You know, they they did enough to beat the team, they did more than enough to beat the teams they were playing against. What they need to look at is will it be good enough when it comes to the crunch in 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 April or May? Um, the co- coverage of Carberry has been fair, but it's been extensive. He's gone down there with massive focus on him, and he's he's handled he's it really well. He's talked about every week, in fact. Oh, absolutely, yeah. and you know, it, it's it's it, but he's handled that very very well. He's yeah. spoken well. He's he's kind of managed to just he's li- lived as most of us adult life in the focus now ever since he kicked those goals against Clontarf you know within six months he was playing against the All Blacks and he just seems quite comfortable with it yeah. he has said at the age of 20 that he wants to be the best player in the world he's owning it you know he's owning that and, and that, you got to admire that ambition or sorry ambition and Jordan Armour saying similar things about the team and mm. these are young players full of confidence who've grown up watching Irish rugby succeed um, I think Munster were you know, provided them with a lovely platform. There was pretty much their first 23 on, on, on Friday yeah. night and it showed. And I think when they have, and it's very hard to get them all on the pitch, but when they have all their players on the pitch, they're, they're as good as anyone. And that's, they were so much better in Gloucester. Their pack was excellent. Their tight five was very good. Their back five, their scrum was, was dominant. A lot of, a lot of tight penalties. burn is exceptional. Yeah, a lot of penalties in that game were in the scrum, weren't there? There was, yeah. And in Munster's it's side. Roman Poitie kind of, yeah. he does tend to, well, you know, he's probably the best scrummaging referee, but he probably is more technical than others. Others would try and get you to play off it. But um, Munster were quite happy to earn those penalties and, and, and put yeah. Gloucester into a tough place. So um, you got it. Like, Gloucester were, were poor at times. You know, the tackle for Rory Scannell's try, which was a pivotal moment in the game when the game was still a contest, was, was pathetic from Charlie Sharples. But, you know, the game was there to be won. They, yeah. they, they hammered Gloucester's weaknesses. They spotted that they couldn't catch a cold, so they kept kicking to them. Like, they, that, that is the thing. I don't want to puncture the hype. I mean, Shane Jennings on the, on the sideline, we were eulogising um, um, Munster, and, and Shane Jennings came in and said he thought Gloucester, frankly, were shocking. And I know it was Friday Night Lights and Full House and all that, but like on the BT commentary, Matt, they were saying, God, God there's a magic about Conor Murray's box kicks, box kicks this evening because literally not one of them could be caught. Uh, the hooker, name escapes me now, was pretty dreadful on the night as well. Like Gloucester were fairly abysmal, you would have to say, given it was a full house. Gloucester were appalling. <laughs> Absolutely appalling. And I watched it. I watched that uh, passage where Munster did 35, 36 tackles just before they, yeah. they uh, Gloucester scored. Mate, it was the most abject attack I have ever seen. Mm. Like they, they were running into Munster players. And I'm not criticising the Munster guys. They were superb. There, there's actually a law in rugby, I think we spoke about it, Jay, the other day, where, where the, the pads on the goalposts are part of the try line. So if you put the ball on the base of that pad, it's a try. And the Gloucester guys, if you go back and watch it, they're actually moving away from the pad. Mm. There's one point there where they all they do is push the ball on the base of the pads a try. They, they just didn't didn't know how to attack, um, dropping balls, you know, and, and as wonderful as Andrew Conway's try was from the left foot kick from Joey Carberry, I was sitting there watching, I just screamed out, where's the fullback? Where, where's, where's the blind wingers? Where, they had absolutely no one in secondary defence, as, as did Toulouse yeah. at, on, on occasions the other day. There was no one in that backfield. So it's 22 metres from the try line or 30 metres from the try line, and they don't have a fullback. It's an, it, that's, that, yeah, that, I mean, Gloucester definitely will draw a line under their awfulness. We agreed on that. That is an interesting broader uh, theme in rugby at the moment. You talk about the secondary, you talk about players being left at home. It was very evident at the RDS as well, and we saw Dave Carney's try in particular. So teams at the moment are not leaving people at home. They're going in a line. There is a sense that we, we, there's not as much variation in the kicking that they're facing, and therefore they feel like they have license to leave fewer people at home. Yeah, uh, it's my bugbear at the moment about the, this generation of, of coaches going around. Not all, not, not in Ireland, but over, especially in the Premiership and in France. They're all just copying each other. So why do it? So what, why are you putting everyone on the line because no one's kicking? So what do you do? You kick. Put a short kicking game in, as Leinster did and as Munster did the other day. You, you employ a short kicking game. At one point there, they, or when um, Dave Carney's wing the only guy in the backfield was uh uh was colby and you know he, he's he's an electric football he's only five foot four and and so they kick to him they kick short to them and this this whole concept of what modern defensive coaches are doing everyone is just copying each other so the old story give your opposition what they don't want if 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 they're putting everyone on the line turn them around put the ball behind them which the irish teams are doing but we're seeing so little thought in attack especially from the premiership sides with the exceptions of Saracens. Mm. I mean, there was some, some really 
awful thinking going on across the across the water at the moment and uh it's a bit inbred you know that there's, yeah. there's no one challenging this is this is uh, again well, my feeling joe that, that when when they're stepping up in europe and and the irish clubs step up in europe understand this is a different level to their domestic competition a lot of the other places that they have no answer to it because they're not used to stepping up and facing something that's slightly different that's that's not the the norm and we saw i think we saw that in spades on saturday yeah and some um, to Rory's point then before we leave Munster, it, it does feel like pretty close to the first time that we have seen Murray, Carberry, Scannell, Farrell, Earls, Conway, and I suppose it, hey, Mike Haley looks very comfortable team, yeah. increasingly in that team. That is pretty much the first time you would say we've seen Munster's backline in a serious game like this. And as Rory says, they may not have the greatest squad yet in European terms, but if that 15 can stay fit, and that 23 can stay fit, then in Cup Rugby, Matt, there's suddenly a real threat this year, maybe ahead of schedule. Joe, you've got to, I've got to give them credit. I've been pretty critical amongst them, uh, especially their away form, and that's what made that game, for me, really stand out. It was an away fixture at Gloucester, full house, and Munster turned up in offence and defence. And they haven't done that uh, regularly, especially at home, they're a formidable side. Away from home, they've been flaky, and they were very good. But I, I've got to say, over the season, I've seen progression in the team. Mm. I've seen progression in all aspects of the side, which Coach Van Graan deserves credit for, the staff deserve credit for. But they're seeing seeing their performance levels step up. Uh, so that's, that puts them in good stead. I think they're really going to regret that game against Cast because if things go the way I, that they could go, they might, they'll might more than likely miss out on a home quarter. There's a few things they need to go their way. Montpellier need to beat Embra. Uh, uh, at Embra for uh, for them to get a home quarter, and that's not guaranteed this year. Okay, and then finally, Rory Omani's fifty fifty. I think that's that's probably generous. Yeah, I think yeah. uh, just look, you know, Peter Omani is a player who will play through the pain barrier. We all know that, and to see him, he tried for about two minutes, and he was just wincing every time he moved. Yeah. Um, he's done something to his ribs that popped the rib is the phrase that was put to Johan you know, McGrath. He was happy to take the vagueness of it. Um, but yeah, we're not going to. He'll be in the Ireland squad on Wednesday, I'm sure. He'll be. Uh, he, they'll keep him in the mix, but I, I can't see him playing this week, especially with the Six Nations around the corner. You just said some, one thing, Joe. You said ahead of schedule. I think it has to be this year or next year for this Munster team, maybe the year off. But like, if you think of the age profile of the, the kind of generation of players yeah. like Omani, Murray, Earls, the leaders in that team, East Stander, they've got to strike while the iron's hot. They, they have yeah. something this year, and I think they have this. All their rivals, although Saracens, Leinster, and Racing, you know, look good in patches at the weekend, and I have. I think this is a year where there's actually going to be an opportunity if they can get on the road in in, uh, in the quarterfinals. This is a real chance for them. Yeah, it's a very fair point. I suppose when I said ahead of schedule, I almost meant I hadn't expected Carberry to blend yeah. in so brilliantly, but totally for the rest of this team, the Keith Earls of the world, they are running out of time. Mm. Um, but they they feel closer to it than I suspected they would after that Racing defeat last year. Course, they felt yeah. a long way away. Yeah last year so uh, we'll see uh, Leinster 29 to lose 13 then uh, Jack Conan and then Dave Carney and then Cronin and uh, Adam Byrne as you'll hear courtesy of Conor Morris Keith Wood and Kevin McLaughlin who were there for off the ball Adam Byrne with the bonus point try Zach Holmes was waiting for he didn't get the pass Nadar was swallowed up but on his own 22 Swallowed up to the extent that it's a Leinster penalty, and they tap and go with Gibson Park, and he seals one all, all the way over the top to Adam Bird, and his try bonus point time for the defending champions of the RDS. What a delivery that was from the replacement scrum half. Yeah, there we are. So uh, 29 points to 13. Leo Cullen said afterwards, Rory, I think I had butterflies about this game for a long time. And I would suspect it all feels like a fait accompli now that they were going to beat Toulouse. Of course they were. But if you think back to those moments before the game, that half hour before the game where the reality of who was missing for Leinster was hitting everyone, I think, and Toulouse were looking fantastic and they're red out there and unbeaten in so long. There was a real sense that there were massive question marks over this game going into it. And uh, it's just a phenomenal performance, result, outcome. Everything about it, it really just underlines everything we've we've said about Leinster for a long time now. It's, it's maybe slightly harsh, but it was a Champions Cup pack with a bit of a Pro 14 backline. Yeah. And they produced a Champions Cup performance and they did it for 80 minutes because I thought the first half was like a mini test match. It was, you know, without the... Physically. The, yeah, physically yeah. I thought the, the, just the 
there was high quality in everything that both teams were doing. I know Toulouse lot didn't have a huge attacking direction, but the collisions were good. You know, you had all blacks playing well. Femwina gassed himself out in half an hour, yeah. but he had a couple of big impacts. Colby probed at the line. The problem they ha- probably had was they picked Ramos at 10. Why did they do that, actually? Because he'd been full back back in October. I know he played well in a couple of recent games at 10 for them in the top 14. Yeah, their first choice 10 isn't great either. Like, they're, they're, that's one probably one area of the squad. If they, that's, if they, that's Holmes. Holmes. Zach, yeah, I, had, Zach I remember Holmes. Zach, but like, um, the fir- like, it's one area of the squad. They've got two, uh, in Dupont and Bezzi, they've got really good scrum halves. Yeah. I think if they have a bit of budget to go after something in, in, the, in the, the summer this year, if they've got a proper uh, out half to run the show for them, or at least complement those scrum yeah. halves, it would be it would probably complete the jigsaw. Um, Entomac looked a bit, looked his age as well. He, he looked like a player who was probably had been advanced. But Leinster made him look that way. I mean, they've won twelve on the trot with him in and out of the team. Mm. But um, but yeah, Leinster showed over eighty minutes that they can play to that Test match standard. They're full of even even their their second string players have a couple of caps under their belt at least. Yeah. Toulouse had 40 minutes of it in them and then got gassed af- afterwards. And I think it just showed that there's a new European order. Um, I wrote this this morning. You know, it's still Leinster, Munster, Racing, Saracens. And while Toulouse have their four stars in their jersey and they're on the way back, yeah. they need to, they, they still have a way to go to crack into that, particularly away from home. And they're going to have to go away in a quarter final, it looks like. Interesting you mentioned them being gassed because I, I, I'd seen in a few places that the Toulouse fitness was being celebrated. But Matt, I know you'd a, you'd a friend who had done a report on Toulouse, been out there, and you were saying pre game, and I think, I think they went with a 6 2 split on the bench as well, uh, Toulouse. You were saying pre game that they are, they're, paying huge attention to their fitness, but actually they're nowhere near where they wanted to be uh, at this stage of the season still. So you kind of saw that one coming a little bit. Yeah, a great friend of, uh, of Irish rugby, Brett Igo, who um, worked for me at Leinster in Scotland, now runs the, the analysis course uh, for, for people who want to learn about sports analysis down at Carlow IT. And Brett uh, had been had spent a week at Toulouse uh, looking at their systems and was, was highly, uh, it gave him great praise and dropped me uh, uh, his report that he'd done on Toulouse uh, and was, uh, gave him a lot of praise in all areas, but said that when you, what, what you do with the fitness, the, the players wear GPS monitors at training and they measure uh, how much intensity your heart rates and all this at high intensity and they keep that high intensity training during the week to in, inside a band so the players aren't fatigued. But the the... Toulouse players are not putting out the numbers at the high intensity for periods of time that, that, that the Irish players are, that the, the Irish provinces are. And that's, there's a whole lot of reasons for that. But Brett said to me, he said, look, they're not going to last. If Leinster can keep the ball and hold them and keep them going for long periods of time, they, their legs are going to give way later on. And uh, he, he was proved yeah. to be very correct. I thought what was uh, very impressive, so Leo Cullen was targeting this game a long way out, Rory, and he would have been aware of the bulk of the injuries, you know, a week, 10 days in advance, but you couldn't have quite predicted what the weather was going to do. So Leinster were into this ferociously strong wind in the first half mm. and adapted their game to suit those conditions. So almost the most impressive thing about the performance. Yeah, well, well they're... they're, they're they do like to keep the ball. I mean, they, they, sure. they, I mean, since that defeat in Claremont, they've tightened up. That first season under Stuart Lancaster was a bit all singing, all dancing. It's not quite as exciting mm. as that now. It's Stuart Barnes called them the most organised team European club and, rugby's ever seen. And I think that's why they can slot in the, the, the players that they did and, and not drop a beat or not miss a beat. Yeah. And I think, you know, to, to what Matt said, they have these so called Tuesdays where Lancaster runs legs off them with, with the ball in play for. You know, long periods of time. Yeah. You know, keeps the ball in play high, and they're really, really fit, and that's what they're able to do. So, um, I thought Bath showed the way against Leinster. Toulouse didn't learn, yeah, and they didn't put any bodies into the breakdown. Um, why, th- why, what was your read on that? Because Bath really did expose that area. Do, do Toulouse just well, not have the players to do that? Well, Cass played extra yesterday, and they put about five into every breakdown, and they got caught wide. So, I suppose if you start putting bodies in, you, you leave yourself vulnerable, and obviously, it ties into the stuff about the players in the backfield. You're trying to. Staff the front line, yeah. but if you give Leinster a quick ball and you have James Ryan, Jack Conan made twenty carries, Reese Foote made twenty carries, mm-hmm. and they're winning the gain line in the way that Irish teams probably didn't against the likes of Toulouse five six years ago. Yeah. You know, um, you're just on the back foot. You have to survive thirty eight phases, and it was funny. It was seen as like the thirty eight phases was a big victory for Toulouse, but it probably cost them in the end because it, it took so much out of them. Mm. Whereas Munster went through thirty five phases and conceded. But Van Graan was, was kind of saying, we got so much from just being able to survive against Gloucester for 35 phases. Mm-hmm. Just the way th- things are interpreted. Yeah. But, um, yeah, look, they adapted the conditions. They 
didn't kick as much, but even when they want, when they had to kick, Rossburn was so accurate with that kick. That's across. a real strength of his. He's as good as anyone at that, isn't he? Absolutely. He yeah. doesn't have much top end speed, but he has an unbelievably accurate cross kick. And um, you know, we, we've seen in, then in the Southern Hemisphere the way the Barretts manipulate defences with their kicking. He's well able to do that, and yeah. it's a real asset for him. And it's one of the reasons he saw off Carberry in, in Leinster because he was so reliable and able to come in and do that. And he runs the game so well akin to Johnny. He's not as good as Johnny, he's not as quick as Johnny, he probably doesn't have the leadership that Johnny Saxon has, mm -hmm. but he s slots in and just makes the right decisions all the time and thinks a couple of phases ahead, which is very impressive. Although there's, you know, I think he's, he might be growing into it. There's certain things you see, obviously, when you're there. There was a moment where they could have taken, this was, I think it was even before Carney's try. It was certainly before the Cronin try and that they were, it was certainly before they were out of sight, yeah. but um, he was the one who dictated to the team they were kicking to the corner. And he could have taken a very easy three points. It was almost pretty, not, not far outside the 22. And it was just a small thing. You mightn't have been picked up on the cameras. But he, w he turned to Rhys Rudder, captain for the day, and said, we're going corner, we're going corner. So maybe he's growing into that. And uh, Big carry off the start, at the start of the game as well. And yeah, 23 years of age, it was a decent statement from him. Um, if you're watching on Facebook or Twitter, get your Heineken Star comments uh, into us. Because this week we have tickets from Munster Exeter, which is a sellout already, to give away to our best comment. Neil says, Joe, keep calm on the Joey Carberry love. Look at the opposition. Leinster aside, they've had a Manchester United-like last six games. Chill, uh, Neil is telling me. I mean, regardless of the opposition, 17 kicks from 17 is worth noting. Well, you can't say Leinster aside. They beat Leinster. <laughs> Leinster European champions. They went to Connacht and won. They, um, they, I, like, they beat Gloucester well. You know, they didn't just squeeze by. They get, they, they, it was the biggest away win in Gloucester's history. Yeah. Carberry's total was the biggest of any player at King's home. I mean, you can't dismiss that stuff. No, and also it's, it, it seems like an easy result now, but actually half an hour before the game, there are nerves, there is pressure. So but Gloucester were still in it. Gloucester could have leapfrogged them with the right result. I'll chill to a point. Yeah. Um, we have David Walsh who's watching in, not the David Walsh, I think he's watching in the Cayman Islands. He says, I always like Monday Night Rugby. It aligns nicely with my lunch break. Hashtag sitting poolside. Hashtag coffee and rugby. We all hate David right now, I think Absolutely. it's fair to say. Yeah. Uh, Shane, Shane Thomas then, Matt. Should uh, Joey be starting one of the bigger Six Nations games, i.e. England or Wales away, regardless of Sexton's fitness? It's a uh, thousand dollar question, isn't it? Mm. Uh, the, it's a very hard Six Nations to manipulate. The answer to that is I don't think Joe will do it. Uh, if he was ever going to do it, it would have been down in uh, Australia. He would have arrested Johnny, but he didn't. He, he thought the win of the series was more important for the team's belief, so he, he didn't. Uh, the game you would do it would be against Italy. The problem with the Italy game, it falls right in the middle, so it would mean that perhaps Johnny wouldn't play for a month. Mm. Play the first two games, there's a two-week break. Play Joe in the Italy game, there's another two-week break. How do, you, how do you sort of keep a, a player at top, uh, top end uh, match fitness? It's a difficult one. I, I, would, I would certainly like to see him have more time. Perhaps that will fall into the uh, World Cup warm-ups. I certainly wouldn't be starting, you, you know, the, the first day uh, on February 3 when, when England play, whoever wins that's going to win the Six Nations. Mm. So you put your best team out that day, and yeah. that's, that's, and that's whoever's standing that day. And you know what, I would put in the argument as well that Johnny Sexton's injury profile of late has been exceptionally good up until Thelman Park. He is the world player of the year. He's played a huge amount of rugby last year off the back of a line season. He went down to Australia, did really well. I mean, he's been absolutely phenomenal. Really, the priority, as much as we all want to develop Carberry, Rory, the priority is to make sure that Johnny Sexton is happy, that he has enough rugby, that he feels good about life. Like, I don't think you want to introduce... Look, individuals are different, and maybe Sexton will respond really well to the threat of a Carberry. You know, but I, why, why would you want to introduce a factor which could upset Johnny Sexton? As in, like, do you want to get it? Do you want to create a dynamic with Carberry and Sexton that is akin to Raj and and Sexton at the time? Because that can happen. Because Sexton is not ready to go yet. I just, you know, it, look, it's tempting for all of us to talk about the Carberry factor. Yeah. But I think it's worth underlining the fact that the priority for Ireland is the World Player of the Year is absolutely happy with life over the next year. Yeah, absolutely, and and we all we do all remember that you know losing Johnny Sexton on, on the morning of the or the, the eve of the, the the Argentina game at the World Cup and E Madigan not having the exposure. Sure, but E Madigan hadn't had the exposure to European games the way that Joey Carberry's getting them. Like that experience on Friday, that defeat in Cast, all those are building in his in his legs, he's he, and his mind. Mm. You know, I'm not that fearful about him being pitched in. Like he did get that first test in Australia, starting against Italy and the USA during the summer, or sorry, during, during November. 
match right the schedule is really difficult yeah, for the yeah, Six yeah. Nations. Yeah. And so it, it's, it's difficult in the pool stages of the World Cup as well because it's kind of front-loaded with the first two games. If they go well, you've got the Russian small games, which are over kind of a 15 or 16 day period into a quarter final. Do you want Johnny Sexton not playing at all during that time? They'll probably give him one of them off, but he needs he needs a run, you know, yeah. like you can't have him going in cold to these games. I mean, the idea of resting Joey for the England game is just not on the table. Resting Johnny. Johnny, sorry, yeah, yeah. starting Joey for the, the England game is not on the table. Wales depends, I guess, on, on how Ireland have done. If, if it's it, Grand Slam, then... If it's Grand Slam, you pick the best players. Yeah. Or even and, if the Six and, Nations title is at stake, which it most yeah, likely and, will be one way or another. And even if it's not, and you, it's the difference between finishing fourth and third, you've still got to, you're, you're trying to build momentum into a World Cup. Yeah. You want to win in Cardiff. So it's, it's a very difficult thing to do, and I, I just don't see... I think Joe Schmidt will pick his best team for all those games, mm. maybe Italy, but as, as Matt said, it's, it's not an easy one. Not least because I think Sexton is not the type of character who says, yeah, it'd be good to give Joey a chance. It's not, oh, it's, he, was, he wasn't happy when he was resting in Australia. No, I wouldn't think so. So just to round off on the Leinster game then, I mean, Gary Ringrose, man of the match, you mentioned Conan and Ruddock, 20 carries apiece, and the pack generally did very well. We were a bit disappointed in uh, Toulouse. Uh, one thing for next week, you mentioned the 30, is it 8 phases or 35 phases Leinster 38. went through. I saw you in the Irish Independent this, this morning just making the point that uh, Gibson Park is obviously back in now, giving them a grand injury situation. So uh, James Lowe might have been useful in that scenario to maybe spark something. Um, it seems impossibly harsh to take out Scott Fardy, but I wonder will Lowe come back in if suspension is up? It kind of depends on uh, Devon Toner. I think they'll probably... They'd probably keep it, even just to kind of remind Lowe that he can't be getting sent off in big games against Munster. I wonder, will they keep him out for another week? But um, I do think they need him in those big games. I think when it comes... I know, I know they beat Racing without him in the, in the final, but having him there and his just unbelievable unpredictability mm. and his capacity to just go forward whenever he gets the ball, the, never dies with the ball, he just gives them something so different. And while Adam Byrne and Dave Carney both scored tries the weekend and played very well, they just don't have that... I hate the word X factor, but that that, yeah. that just unpredictability and, and low gives them something different. And Larmer does as well. And when they have both of them on the wings, with Rob Kearney in the middle with the security, they're just a far more dangerous team. Yeah. Um, Larmer was a little bit peripheral at the weekend. I, I think you know. I think he gets more involvement on uh, on the wing. So yeah, I think if they're going to win it, they need to have low on the pitch because he dovetails very well with Sexton as well yeah. and he creates he creates havoc when he gets the ball and there's a lot to be said for that yeah uh, quick word on that Matt yeah I'd, I'd agree with that I thought Scott Fardy on, uh, was absolutely sensational on the weekend but uh, James Lowe is just in great form yeah. and you, you've got to pick your best side that's simple and that, and that goes with Johnny too like we're all stuff around and talk about Joey Look, you, know, you pick your best players you got the world player of the year. You pick him. You put, you put him on the field every time, hundred mm. percent. It's not. It's not. It's not even a thought mm. in it. You know, you, you you develop somewhere else. This Irish team can win a Six Nations and win a World Cup. So get your best team on the field. And if you're not good enough, you don't make it. Get on with life. And I'd be I'd be the same. The same with with James James. He he needs a kick in the bum for getting a red card, like Rory said. But uh, he's he's the best winger in the club. Okay. Oh, is he? Okay. Right. Um. So, honestly, we laughed at Stephen Ferris and said, yeah, 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 when he said Ulster could do something against Racing, the magic of Belfast and all that kind of stuff. And then, um, well, as you would have heard in Off the Ball, Jacob Stockdale can't be discounted. And Ulster had to put in at scrum day. Shanahan gives it off now to Will Addison. Will Addison looping his run around. It's Stockdale. Stockdale shakes off attacker. He's over the 10-metre line. He's approaching at 22. It's the chip and chase that we saw against New Zealand. It it's unbelievable. It's like a try we saw against New Zealand. It's Jacob Stockdale. He's a miracle man. Ulster 21. Racing 92-10. That is the most Jacob Stockdale try you'll ever see. It's beautiful. It's poetry in motion. It's Ulster with three tries. There you are, Oshin Langan doing it justice, enjoying it the way it, it should be enjoyed. Uh, it's quite something for a 21-year-old to have a trademark try, Matt. Oh, he's some, he's some uh, operator, isn't he? he, he uh, the, the, the thing about that try is the start of it, the power in his palm where he, he, he constantly beats that first defender. Very powerful dude with that push-off. You know, yeah. it, was, it, was, it was no, uh, no easy push-off as well. And then the chip and chase, I criticised uh, teams for not having anyone in the backfield. Rassing had three of them <laughs> at the ball, and the ball sidestepped all through them straight into his hands. Yeah. But, look, he, he, he's just consistent. You know, if he did it over a couple of games, you'd say, oh, that's luck. I mean, the guy's just been doing it week in, week out. 
breaking records, and and that was a sensational try. Well, you, he got a bit of he got a bit of luck, but it was still a great kick. Okay, well, you've raised all the questions I want to ask there. So there's a, there's a, there's a, you probably answered the first one. I was going to make the point. Certainly, uh, Scarlett's away. His try down the left hand side there. The point was made that oh well, well, he really should have been tackled. You know, like there was hands on him. And equally, I think it was him off. He ran outside in Belfast yeah, for, before kicking right, it. Yeah. So they, again you would watch it in isolation and say, oh, he should have been tackled. You know, basically there were hands on him or close to him. So he's now developing, we'll get on to the kick part in a second, but he's developing this habit of actually, we're saying he should have been tackled there and yet he's not. And he's becoming a common denominator in that. So maybe it is defend, as you say, but he's doing something when players feel they're about to get him. Maybe it's his footwork that we're not noticing. I don't know. Yeah, he's got a very powerful palm. Uh, he, he pushes guys off very well. Uh, the, Jonah Loma should have been tackled a lot, but he wasn't because he was good. Mm. You know, this, uh, this, he's not Jonah Loma, I'm not suggesting that. But this, this guy's developed into uh, not just a young player of interest, he's, he's really coming along into a very, very good rugby player because of that thing. He's, he's very powerfully built, he's got great speed, he uses his feet well, but he uses his hands well. He pushes guys off, he's got a good palm, and that's what he did. He used all that combination against him and off, he, he used his good footwork, he was in a bad position and just palmed him really powerfully. And he's, I've seen him do that before. Shane Horgan was the one that put me onto that. He said, watch, watch the power in his upper body when it comes towards contact. And he did that on Saturday. Or, uh, Rory, yeah, Saturday. Rory, I asked um, Bernard Jackman this question yesterday and he quickly enough shot me down and said, no, nah, not really. So I'll, I'll put it to both of you. So that's now a few times he's done his little kick over the top and managed to have a sense of where the ball was going to go. Yeah. So is the ball uh, quite literally just bouncing his way at the moment and he's in this sweet spot? Or have we seen players down the years who have had some kind of innate sixth sense um, given you know they know what way the ball comes off their foot, they can predict particularly well what way a ball is going to bounce? I don't, no, I don't think so. I, okay. I, I think he's riding the crest of a wave and things are going his way. And he's making things go his way in some degrees by putting himself in those positions. But the only person that I've ever seen successfully manipulate the ball like that would be Rodan O'Gara and you know, be able to get the spiral completely right. But he was winding up. He was an out half, an expert kicker, winding up with a bit of time from a perfect Peter Stringer delivery. Like Stockdale's doing this on the... He's just beating him off. <laughs> There's a guy in front of him, he's chipping him over and he's chasing the ball. And like he is literally just following that ball wherever it goes. But how did three racing players not predict the bounce and he did? I'm not sure. I think he waited. I think okay. he had a bit of patience and he just waited for it to bounce because he knew well, the three of them were on the ball. If it bounced forward the way he expected to bounce, it's no try and it's, a, it's probably a bad decision to get the ball away. Yeah. But uh, Jacob Stockdale doesn't make bad decisions right now and he's, uh, yeah, he's, he, like, there's nothing wrong with riding that wave. I mean, there's an element of luck in, in a lot of the scores that he's getting, but he's making his own luck to a degree as well. And right. It's, uh, it's very, very impressive. That's two out of two shot me down, Matt. Can you please identify a player who's been able to predict the bounce of a rugby ball? Uh, look, I, I, I slightly disagree with, well, not completely disagree with Roy, but you, you, you know, he's obviously practicing that kick. So uh, if you if you do a chip, if you're running out pace, you do a chip, the ball and, and you hit it on the, your tail the right way, the ball will rotate, will rotate. So that means when it lands, it'll bounce straight. Uh, and I agree with you, Ron Agar was a genius at it. But it's a different type of kick. So he's not kicking long, he's kicking short. What what and what he's doing, he's not over kicking the ball. The ball's not going dead. So we've got to give him some credit for the for the for the creation of that of that kick and the other part is it's not going out the ball is just coming infield I, th I think on Saturday that particular try he was lucky he got luck at the end but you, you, you're you your kicks only as good as your chase there were three racing guys there and I thought they stuffed up I thought they all thought the other guy was going to get it and then the next bounce went his way mm. but you know he, he's done a lot of kick through like we think of we think of um uh, it's a Patrick's Day in Twickenham obviously against the Blacks and then this one, he, he's practicing that that play. Yeah. Uh, but once a rugby ball, after the second time a rugby ball hits the ground, then it's luck. Right. Because okay. it, can go, it goes anywhere. Well, know, I'm attributing a, a superpower to him that he knows and no one else does. <laughs> so that's that's my story. Six and five, uh, six tries in five games. Now he's the top scorer in the competition, fresh off being uh, the record-breaking top scorer in the uh, Six Nations 2018. So remarkable stuff for him. Um, we'll get on to uh, Robert. Balakun is worth a quick mention. Um, he was started on the other wing. He scored the try. So he's 21 year, years old. He from, he's from Enniskillen. Uh, Jacob Stockdale said, this guy is way faster than me. Uh, he seems to be a sprinter. Has played sevens for Ireland. So 
21 years old, making his, I don't know if it's his European debut, but we haven't seen much of him in Europe, that's for sure. Yeah, thankfully you gave me a heads up, you were going to ask me about him, I looked him up, and he played Towns Cup, he played in the Towns, Ulster, Ulster Towns Cup final in April 2017. Okay. As recently as that, he was playing club rugby for Alan Skillen, but the, you know, the talent ID scheme is obviously working, they've identified him as a, a, a real out and out speedster, got him on the seventh circuit, he says that the, the seventh circuit improved his defence, you know, so he's, he's come into the Ulster setup this year, reasonably unmapped, um, Dan McFarland's gone for him and I thought losing Henry Spate was going to be a big loss for them because I thought he was a really impressive member yeah. of their team yeah. and it's a callow of squad as we've said over and over again over the last couple of weeks but he stepped into that role instead of Spate and he looked really at home and even you know he, he got a two week ban after that Munster game when he probably should have been sent off in the mm. first minute but he popped up the winning try in that game which I think enraged Munster all the more he's got a a bit like Stockdale he's got a good knack of showing up and scoring mm. tries he's got a good record in the senior team and you know his speed adds another string to your bow. There's yeah. no, there's no substitute for pace, as they say, and and he is, uh, he's devastating when they give him a bit of time and space. So when you've got Stockdale and Mumming, yeah, you know th having this guy, if all the attention is on Stockdale, they've got the 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 centres and Addison is the playmaker who can get the ball out to him. Mm. It's a decent decent mix they have in that back line. Yeah. So Welford Road next weekend, Leicester beaten again at the weekend. Their domestic form has improved. Mm. It's hard to know to what extent. At home, they'll give this the right lash and try and sign off from Europe in decent fashion. But Ulster go there. 